Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Hush No More Champions. My name is Dr. Vanessa Dunn Guyton, and I am the founder and the executive director of Hush No More. Hush No More supports survivors when they're ready to come forward to share their story, to get resources, to just have somebody to listen. We also provide free training in our communities, to churches, youth groups, different community organizations to raise awareness. We believe that awareness plus knowledge equals prevention. So thank you for joining us again today. This is going to be a really good episode. Did y'all see that? I'm really excited because I have the beautiful Elizabeth Sullivan. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I am so excited that you're here. Tonight, we're going to talk about empowering survivors, which is a great topic. Great, great topic. So tell the audience a little bit about Elizabeth. All right. Well, uh, I live in Minnesota. And uh, years ago, when... I was probably around 42. I was what you call triggered. And uh, that trigger brought me into a lot of um, childhood sexual abuse memories, uh, triggered a lot of flashbacks, went into full PTSD. And um, through all that, I ended up uh, starting an organization by the name of Empower Survivors. Uh, located in Stillwater, Minnesota. Um, the mission of Empower Survivors is to uh, support those that were affected by childhood sexual abuse. And uh, so that's what I do. I love it. What do you mean when you say triggers for people that's not really um, familiar with that term? Sure. So a trigger is something that... <laughs> I'm sorry, you're just... No, no, you're fine. I, I, it's I, darn cute that I just... <laughs> <laughs> so a trigger, a trigger is something that in your, your present life um, brings you back to the past. So maybe it can be a certain smell. It can be um, a feel of something. It can be a certain sound, a word. It can be a lot of different things that will suddenly uh, trigger something in the present and, and all of a sudden... Um, memories can come forward or panic attack can happen or a flashback or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't think people really understand triggers and mm -hmm. how they happen because they'll say things like, how do you remember? How did it, <laughs> why did you wait so long to tell? Because you mm -hmm. didn't always know you weren't even in that present. So I'm glad that you explained that because a lot of people don't understand triggers and how often they happen. And that is real. And that is Absolutely. real. And I think especially when it comes to childhood sexual abuse, uh, the majority of us never have dealt with it before and uh, in our childhood. So it isn't really until, <coughs> excuse me, until we're well into our midlife that a lot of us um, start to deal with the sexual abuse that was done to us. So uh, for a lot of us, it is the trigger um, that becomes kind of the opening of Pandora's box where we finally start to deal with the abuses done to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I truly want to thank you for coming on to just show how somebody could go from being a victim, being triggered. Now you're a survivor, you're at a really good place, and now you're empowering others. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to start an entire organization around this? You know, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact, um, actually, I, I say this all the time. So if you've heard me before, you probably heard this piece, but it was actually one night I was up in my upstairs bathroom. I had come out of a really bad uh, flashback. I had the therapist on the phone and I was talking to the therapist saying, I just cannot believe because I'm trying to get my head back together because I had three kids down in the lower floor and uh, a husband at the time that I had to come back and try and act normal in front of and try and um, get myself back together. But it was in that moment one night uh, while I was on the phone with the therapist that I said, why on earth? Uh, 
if if this kind of stuff can happen to kids where they shut it so far in the back of their mind that then it comes forward as an adult and suddenly your life is turned upside down and basically you're gutted why why aren't we talking about this as a society why aren't we talking about it why aren't there more opportunities um of growth for survivors why why is it that we're having trouble having therapists that know good trauma care and that sort of thing and i think it was out of some anger and frustration um that actually made me decide we need to form an organization because i wanted something uh where people that had lived experience that were further along in their journey could eventually um, help others. And I think there's something that's part of the healing journey that really helps the individual when now you take what has happened to you and you use it to help others. Mm -hmm. I think that is a big healing journey for me. <clears throat> I love helping others share their story. I love empowering those to just say, hey, you can get to a point of healing. You don't have to be sad. You don't have to be broken. Let's get to a good place. And to show other people that there is the possibility to get to a healthy place. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny because I think the first people we have to take care of is ourselves. So when I first came up with the idea, you know, I remember, you know, going back to the therapist saying, all right, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to do this and we're going to, you know, have groups and da, 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 da. And, and my therapists were like, that's wonderful. But the first person you need to help is yourself. And so I had to make sure that I got to the point um, that I could uh, where I wasn't going to be triggered, where, um, you know, I was far enough on my journey where it wasn't going to be detrimental for me to um, use this passion to help others. Um, but really, I think for people that come from childhood sexual abuse, I really do feel like it's a lifelong journey. Um, so I never say, you know, survivors will come to me and they'll, they'll say, well, you know, when I get to be where you're at, then I won't have any problems. And it's, you know, it, it's different. The healing journey, I think, is lifelong. So I don't want to say that I don't ever have um, maybe a trigger or, or that sort of thing. I'm still, you know, there's certain stuff that I still have to deal with as a survivor, but uh, definitely not anywhere near it was when the box first flew open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People assume because you have an organization, because you're speaking, that you're just healed and it's gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not. Oh, I don't have triggers like I used to. But you know, I, I would tell you a trigger that triggered me that I didn't expect. The specialist Vanessa Gillum from the Fort Hood, the soldier, the Hispanic soldier mm -hmm. that was killed. I don't know if it was because we have the same name, because she was in the army or what, but I had a rough day when I found out about that. And it was just like setback. And I was like, okay, Vanessa, you gotta get through this. You gotta get through this. You know, there was nothing you could do for her. I was just so sure. sad about her. And then it was like, okay, the next day I was okay. Mm -hmm. It was a hard day. And so sometimes people think because you're working in this field, you're advocating that you're healed. And that's not, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. you're working on it as well. What does your healing journey, healing journey look like? What did you do to get to that point? Well, it was real messy at first. At first, uh, you know, I think... Uh, when it first opened up, when Pandora's box first opened up, I think I went from, you know, I, I said that I was, I went from what I considered a good Christian woman uh, raising a family to um, just my life completely turning upside down and, and uh, feeling completely gutted. Um, so it, there was a lot of therapy uh, individual therapy. And I, and as I go through this, I want to say everybody's journey is different. So what's good for one isn't good for maybe somebody else. But for me, it meant getting into some pretty intense therapy that was twice a week and eventually um, getting into a group therapy as well. 
uh, something that I absolutely did not want to do. Uh, but it took a lot of a lot of individual therapy, uh, group therapy help then um, with seeing other individuals that um, were also on their journey and that sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would say a lot of it too was unlearning everything that I had been taught, either said or unsaid by the abusers that I had in my life. Uh, so it's it was really having to have somebody point out to me where the cognitive distortions were, um, you know, challenging the negative thought patterns that I had, um, you know, so all of that, a lot of reading. I did uh, just unbelievable amount of research because I, I really wanted to figure out myself more. Uh, not only figure out myself more, but I wanted to understand the neurobiology. I wanted to understand um, how it affected the whole person, mind, body, and soul. Uh, so a lot of research and, and you know, finding um, people in my life that were going to be supportive of, of myself and my journey. Um, and it meant also weeding out a lot of individuals that were going to help keep me sick rather than empower me to be um, a healthy woman. So, you know, it meant uh, ending some relationships that I may have really um, loved, uh, but knew that it was going to keep me stuck. So a lot of different changes like that a lot of a lot of um, growing in self-awareness and really um, having some good therapists I had two different ones and and I had to be taught what boundaries were I had no idea what boundaries were I had no idea what healthy relationships looked like um, and uh, and had some pretty bad self-esteem issues and that sort of thing. So uh, a lot of a lot of growth in those areas too. And just having somebody that I could trust to sit down and dissect all these different thought patterns uh, that I had due to being abused. Yeah. And that sounds mm -hmm. like a lot. And I'm pretty sure it's not all. That's oh. the next version. <laughs> How many years? <laughs> That's very convinced. How many years from when you found out from your trigger, when you remembered everything and it started coming back to starting the organization? How many years was that? I'm trying to think because I started, <clears throat> excuse me, I started in 2012. Uh, that's when the box, I say, flew open. That's when I really started to deal with the things. And it wasn't, well, it was actually kind of early, uh, about 2014 was when I decided, okay, let's, let's start looking into this. Let's start um, kind of the very infancy of the organization. So 2014. Okay. That's not a long time. Mm -mm. I mean, you was doing some work, but you said you were going to therapy twice a week. So that's a lot too. So mm -hmm. what's working? I, I love that, that mm -hmm. you did it. You were ready to heal and ready to get to the next level. That's oh. imperative. Well, you know, it's funny because I thought that I was ready at first, uh, but, you know, I danced around the issues in the therapy office and didn't, uh, I, I wanted to heal, but yet I didn't want to go anywhere near um, any topics that I'd have to go to in order to heal. Uh, so I think I, you know, at first spent a lot of time avoiding. And then at a certain point, I realized that with this, there's no avoiding that you have to look it straight in the eye and, and work through all the muck and mess and everything else. So and I still, even after uh, starting the organization, you know, I still continued with therapy and that sort of thing. But I had to wait until I got to that point where it was, you know, safe for me to take the next next step. And and sometimes it meant three three days of therapy a week. It just depended where I was at. 
Yeah. Uh, I like that, that you're transparent about it. And <laughs> you have to put in the work. Mm -hmm. It is important to put in the work. It Absolutely. Is, yeah. um, because, we have some time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I was going to say, the reason we, it, another thing too I had to learn about putting in the work was I think there was a part of me that thought, um, somehow somebody else was going to come around and, and fix it for me. And I think uh, one of the hardest things was realizing that in order to really uh, move forward, it meant I was going to have to go inside and I was going to have to be my own hero because uh, nobody else was going to be it. And uh, so I think that's part of the learning, uh, too, that goes along with this. Mm -hmm. That's quotable. Nobody else is going to be your hero. Got to be your own hero. Sounds good. <laughs> That's the quote, Elizabeth. I love that. You are your own hero. Yeah, you are your own hero. Nobody coming to save you. You got to do it yourself. Yeah, sadly, that's the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, I could laugh about it now, but I was like, nobody mm -hmm. saved me. You have to get up and do your work. Mm -hmm. so we yeah, have It's ugly work. <laughs> like you said, messy. I love it. It is messy. You know, you're mm -hmm. going to cry. Your makeup's going to run. You know, you'll be frustrated, but I love that we are our own hero. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Kim said, hi, Kim, welcome to the show. You said they really don't understand. I had a conversation with my mom about her not understanding why people remember their abuse after so many years. People don't. I like when we talk about the memories and how mm -hmm. we suppress them and we've made false memories and how everything just works around with the, the neuroscience. It's amazing about how the brain suppresses trauma. Mary said, I have never spoken where I share my story that one or more people share some part of their story. There is confidence that comes for others with sharing our stories. And she also said, setting boundaries is essential to healing. There's mm -hmm. a reason and a season for those in our lives. Letting go is hard. Yep. And mm -hmm. therapy is so important. You learn that you cannot jump or walk around the fire. You must walk through it. Boy, that fire is hot too, Mary. So thank you for that. <laughs> and, and ugly it's it's an ugly thing absolutely you know i i wanted to say something in reference to what kim had mentioned about uh you know sometimes family and that sort of thing um oftentimes a lot of survivors when it comes time to opening up to their families uh we hope that our families and and friends are going to be our biggest cheerleaders and be the ones that are there for us and and really um coming in and and uh being our biggest supporters and a lot of times that isn't the case a lot of times um people don't understand you know why is this adult who's now 40 50 60 70 on up why suddenly are they um you know dealing with this and why are they upset about something that happened 40 50 years ago so there's there's this attitude because they don't know trauma um, that, you know, why don't, why aren't these people just getting over it or, you know, move on or, or this sort of thing. And they don't realize, um, that, you know, the child's brain, the way that it's built is to store that in a different part of the brain. And we go on, um, a lot of times we splinter off from that. And, uh, so we have to go back with our adult brain and, and reprocess all, or process, not reprocess, but process um, all these things that we never had a chance to as children. But I think for the average person um, who doesn't all, uh, understand trauma and also for people that perhaps maybe have trauma in their backgrounds that have never dealt with their own issues, um, sometimes they end up doing more uh, harm than good by their not understanding. So that's why it's so important. I just love what you're doing here. Um, it's so important to have these conversations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. and so you you want to get mad, but then you also think that, well, it's just a lack of knowledge. So how mm -hmm. can I inform you? And family is not always supportive. Sometimes they're the one that's saying the harshest things. They're the one that's discouraging you. Absolutely. That's, that's difficult, your family and friends. And I think that brings up another level of betrayal. Um, it ends up, I, I know for myself and for many other survivors, 
um, you know, when there's, when the family or, or your loved ones react a certain way that's unsupportive, uh, it's another sign of betrayal. I mean, it's another betrayal. So it's another deep hurt um, that now you have to try and process that as well. And, and I think it's really, really hard for people, if they haven't gone through it, um, to really understand the survivor. Yeah, I don't under, I don't understand how people don't believe you. They believe the offender, the abuser, the predator. How they believe them and not like you don't believe your own child or you don't believe your sister or your brother. And I just don't get that. Like <laughs> I just don't. And I'm working on it. I realize that sometimes people have their own trauma in their life. Mm -hmm. They they want to ignore. That's also mm -hmm. an issue. But I'm at a loss for that. Absolutely. And I think uh, not only, I mean, predators are good. I mean, not only are they uh, grooming the children, but they're grooming everybody around them. So, I mean, too often, I mean, everybody thinks this particular predator is somebody who's, you know, some shady looking character out on the street. And uh, no, they're oftentimes very jovial. I mean, depending, I mean, there's different predators. I had several that are, you know, different types of personality. Um, some were very kind, some were, were um, horrible and uh, really evil and, and uh, cruel and other ones were cruel, but in a more, uh, how do you say it, uh, kind of more sly way, a more um, kind way. So, I mean, oftentimes a predator might be loved by other people. Mm -hmm. I always think about Ted Bundy, how charismatic mm -hmm. he was. Absolutely. Everybody loved him. People trusted him. So that's what they look like. You know, mm -hmm. the handsome, the nice, very sweet, loving on everybody. That's what they look like. Absolutely. And not the stranger behind the mask. You know. No, and not that, I mean, and really we, you know, when we talk about childhood sexual abuse, majority of it is somebody that the child knows and, and trusts, the family trusts, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, very, very rare is it the stranger just off the street. So, I mean, yes, that does happen, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of times they're the people right inside our own families. Mm -hmm. Right in our house, right? That's mm -hmm. smiling in our face. That's the mm -hmm. thing so mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Susie said, um, getting therapy is key. Thank you, Susie, for joining us. Linda said, Vanessa, we have to be our own heroes. Yes, we do, Linda. I, I love mm -hmm. that whole concept. Mary said she started therapy in 1984, not only for herself, but her family. And still today, like Elizabeth, she, it's ongoing. So she can relate. Absolutely. She can feel it there with you. And that people don't understand. She thinks people do understand it, but they are not ready to hear your trauma that triggers theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I do believe that they have some underlying trauma and they don't want to hear it and they don't want to really admit that this thing has happened, you know? And sometimes I think it goes, I, I really don't think they always know. Sometimes they know, you know, right and wrong. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know right or wrong. Mm hmm. So you had mentioned that part of your healing journey was like removing people from around you. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? How did you accomplish that? It's not always easy. It, it wasn't because for a long time, I fought very hard to try and get people to understand. You know, I think, um, I think part of being a survivor sometimes is over explaining or, um, trying to get somebody to just understand uh, your, where you're at and, and get that validation. Um, but it wasn't easy. Uh, it meant that, you know, there were people that I truly loved that I need to remove uh, because there was codependency, because they were unhealthy as well. Um, and let's see, how did I do it? I think I think it took it took a lot of therapy and it took a point in therapy to realize that I had some worth. And once that I realized that I had worth 
and and once I realized that, um, one, I could say no. Two, I could actually have some expectations. <laughs> you know, all these types of things that you think would be normal for a person to know. Um, I didn't uh, necessarily know. So I, I, I would say that it was, uh, it took, a lot of therapy to get me to be able to do that. And at a certain point when I got far enough in my healing journey and I, I knew I had worth, I knew that, um, it, you know, that, that it was okay to have certain expectations. Uh, then at a certain point I thought, you know what, I deserve better than this and it became easier to cut people out of my life. But, but it was hard, it was really hard because I kind of had a habit of if there was um, if there was somebody that was going to be really nasty as far as uh, somebody to date, uh, I tended to go for those. And <laughs> you know you pick what you feel like you're worth. And unfortunately, um, looking back, some of the choices that I made were abusive and um, what I, you know, what I allowed um, was unhealthy. And uh, even though I wasn't responsible for other people's behavior, of how they treated me, um, you know, I taught them in ways because of where I was coming from uh, that it was okay to treat me like that. Um, now... I'm on the other end of it where I have to be careful <laughs> not to be too rough on somebody and, and uh, you know, have too big expectations. But, you know, we're not going back to what we thought would be okay before because it usually meant uh, either domestic type of situations or, or something else. And uh, so... Yeah. When you know your work, that is powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think part of empowering people is to use your voice. Absolutely. You know, to, to be able to make a choice and to be able to say, you know, I don't have to tolerate this. My mm -hmm. new motto is, if you're not adding to my happiness, because it's my responsibility to make me happy. Can nobody else make you happy? Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility. But I need you to add to it. You need to maintain it and add to it. If you're not doing that, then you can't be in my circle. Absolutely. So I've been telling people, remove people out of your circle if they're not doing that. They should be making you happy, adding to it, adding yeah. to your happiness. And so it's important that you have you identified that and you did it. Mm -hmm. you did oh, it. yeah, because otherwise they suck you dry and there's no life in that. It's mm -hmm. just it's just a horrible place to be. So <laughs> I've had family say, well you just doing it for attention. I'm just like, people do not tell you that they've been abused for attention. That's like... <laughs> Absolutely. I was I prefer not to have the attention. Trust me. Like God put me on this platform, but it's definitely not for attention. I could have skipped the trauma. You know, just had to show. <laughs> Absolutely. I was told that as well. I found out later on that there is members of uh, my circle that thought that I was doing it for simply for attention. And, uh, and that wasn't it at all. In fact, I always say with empower survivors, um, it isn't about me. It's about all survivors. It's about getting, uh, giving voice to what's happened. It's about healing and that sort of thing. Um, but it's going to take people like you and I and other survivors to come forward with our stories and, uh, or to, um, get healing uh, to to fix this issue that we have. This, you know, because it affects every part of society. And I think, um, you know, if the more we get this out there, the more we have platforms like what you're providing here, um, the more healing that can happen to us as individuals, and also our communities are going to be healthier. So we need people to speak up and. And so I agree with you 100%. It isn't about um, it isn't about us. It isn't about us trying to get notoriety or that sort of thing. It's about trying to 
um, protect our most vulnerable and uh, support those that for no fault of their own were terribly abused and traumatized as children. It was a crime. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Love it. Somebody else can relate to me. <laughs> and that's why I do this too, so that you can see that somebody else is relatable. We're going through this journey together. Yeah, Absolutely. we're healing together. You're not by yourself, you're not alone. <laughs> you got somebody else that can really relate to what you're going through. So. Absolutely. Because we were alone, most of us were alone during the abuse. So to be able to come together as a community and support one another on our healing journeys, uh, that's really important. It is. All right, you have two questions. The first question is from Mary. She said, Elizabeth, do you think that your anger caused fear in those who you wanted to know about the trauma? Did you experience that? Uh, well, I definitely experienced anger. <laughs> A lot of it. Um, can you say the question? I'm sorry. Can you say the question one more time? Do you think that your anger caused fear in those you wanted to know about the trauma? Like when you told them, were they scared? Uh, you know, there, I can remember one time in particular when I was talking to certain family members. Um, at that time, I was very um, early into my healing. It was a matter of I wanted to give a little bit of information, but I wanted it to be on my terms. And um, in that day, I, I, my anger got really out of control because I actually was triggered by something a family member said. And I remember slamming the table so hard that everybody's teacups rose off the table. And I scared the heck out of them. And I was so angry because um, it was so painful. I had so much pain. And instead of it coming out as sadness, it came out sideways and came out with anger. And I also have PTSD. So uh, the anger was, um, could become a real monster if I, if, if I wasn't careful. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think um, my anger probably scared some people. Yeah. And, and rightly so, it's understandable. It's like an emotional roller coaster. It's like you like, woo, <laughs> and I get off of this roller coaster. <laughs> Let me off the ride. So yeah. absolutely, and that anger thing can affect so many things because it can even. I mean, somebody could be saying something to you that reminds you of that something with the PTSD. That can remind you of something from the past, and you can actually. Um, react with the anger um and you're not even really angry at that person necessarily it's of something that happened in the past if that makes sense mm -hmm. um but anger was something that uh, i i really had to uh, navigate through um and still to this day there's certain times where i could be triggered and if i'm not careful i could react before um, thinking and, and it might come out as some pretty strong anger. Not like, you know, crazy, like, well, what's crazy, but not like where I'd hurt an individual, but uh, a pretty explosive, you did me wrong type of <laughs> anger <laughs> kind of thing. Absolutely. And totally understand that. Yeah. Totally understand that, rightly so. Mm -hmm. um, Susie wants to know, when that person comes around, how do you tell if they changed or if they're real? So like when the abusers come around, when family come around, and they've done things to hurt you. You know, I do not see any, I, I had several different perpetrators. None of them do I see. They, they weren't in my family. Um, they were people I knew. Uh, but fortunately, I'm not forced to look at them like many, <coughs> many survivors that have had incest in their family or, you know, I mean, they may have, you know, they may have to run into the person that perpetrated them. Um, I guess on, on one hand, I'm, I'm lucky that I don't have to see them. 
Um, there was, like I said, there were several of them, how I'd react if I were to have them walk in my path again. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. There was several years ago where I thought, um, I was walking into a store and I thought the person that had, uh, raped me as a child, uh, was walking out and I immediately froze. Um, so I guess I'm lucky in the sense that I, I am not see, having to see any of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and that was the thing too of why I, I actually opened the nonprofit where it is because most of my perpetrators were in the hometown that I lived or in the, we're, we're kind of on a border uh, right on the river. So you just drive across on the bridge on the river and we're right next to Wisconsin. So I had a perpetrator in Wisconsin. I had several uh, in uh, the St. Croix area in Minnesota. And uh, so kind of my way of getting back was to put this organization right in the epicenter of that and and have a conference um a yearly conference that would draw attention and there's part of me that thought you know i almost hope that they see what i'm doing um because they should be shaking in their boots a little bit i mean they <laughs> not that you know because sadly most of the time our perpetrators aren't seeing the inside of a jail or a prison. Definitely. I mean, sadly, most of them will never see it, you know, will never be held accountable for the crimes that they did. And none of mine uh, did. So I guess this is one way of me to get some personal satisfaction is to be in the area and kind of be as loud as I possibly can without sounding too crazy. <laughs> you're loud too, and I love it. I love that you're loud. Um, I, I, Susie, I think that um, for me, forgiveness is for myself and not for them. And I don't know if they ever change or not. I just have to move forward from them. Like, I, just have to, I can't worry about you. I don't care about you. You're never going to be in my space again. Like, I don't have to... I, God says I have to love you, but I don't have to like you, and I don't have to chill with you. <laughs> was, was that the question? I'm sorry, I went off on a little tangent. No, no, you answered it. Answer it. No, you answered it, but oh, okay. um, because you're because you really couldn't speak to that one because that's not for you. But Linda, she made a comment. She said she disclosed to her brother to protect her daughter, his daughter, mm -hmm. and the family told the perpetrator, which was her father, and disowned her. So. Sometimes family will push you away or you can push family away. But uh, for me, um, I just need to move on, not worry about who you are. And I'm just not going to deal with you no more. You're completely out of my circle. Because mm -hmm. people people may change, but that's for them and God. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, another thing about that forgiveness piece is people will always, uh, you know, they'll say, well, you have to forgive. Um, I'll never at at our organization, we will never tell you that you have to forgive your perpetrators. Um, that's totally up to you if you decide to do that, but that isn't something we're ever going to tell you that you have to do. Um, the only person I say you really truly have to forgive is yourself. Uh, for all the things that you had no control over, you know, go easy on yourself. It wasn't your fault. You didn't do anything to, um, to make this happen or have this happen. You didn't choose to have it happen. And, and so uh, forgiving yourself is really the key. I love that. And I, I have forgiven myself, which was really hard. You gotta mm. be gentle with yourself. Mm. You gotta be gentle with yourself. Absolutely. Self-compassion. I mean, mm. because too many of us, frankly, you know, it's really unfortunate when you think about it. I mean, it's bad enough you're sexually abused and raped as a child, but then you, we, we take it on. We take the bullet and, uh, and, and we hate ourselves for it. And, uh, and in, in our healing journey, 
Uh, we have to learn to forgive ourselves, have compassion for ourselves, have compassion for the little person inside that there's no way could have stood up to anybody who is an adult. Um, and, and so that compassion, I think, is hugely important for the healing journey. I, I do too. I truly do too. You can't move on. You can't move forward if you don't do that. Absolutely. I don't see it. You just, you can't really move forward. So tell me about your organization and how do they, how do you and your team empower survivors? What does that look like from an organization standpoint? Well, up before COVID, before we had COVID, we had a once a year annual event that was a conference that would bring people together from the United States. Um, and well, I mean, people could have flown in <laughs> from outside of the United States. Maybe that will come at some point. But uh, we had a yearly conference. We did a lot of um, peer support groups uh, at our organization, but with COVID and everything else and having to uh, deal with the changes that came about with COVID, uh, everything switched to online. So at this point, everything's over Zoom. Uh, we have uh, the way that we empower people is to create communities of safe spaces where survivors can gather, where we can support one another. So Monday nights, we have conversations with Evie and Elizabeth. Uh, Evie is a um, <clears throat> somebody who has come on board and just been a phenomenal asset to the organization. Uh, so it's that's more topic driven. We talk about different things that are pertinent to survivors and healing. <coughs> Sorry, it's allergy time here in Minnesota. So that's part of the deal there. But so through programs like that, we have peer support groups and, uh, and, and that empowers survivors kind of in between uh, therapy sessions and that sort of thing where they can gather with other survivors, um, talk about maybe things that are going on in their life. Maybe they were triggered. Maybe they're having troubles with nightmares. Um, so providing that safe space where you can have those types of conversations. So uh, basically, through programs, classes, and in the peer support groups. And then, of course, we also have several groups on Facebook, uh, closed groups, uh, several that are for um, sexual abuse, um, some for uh, child abuse and trauma, and then uh, a new one that's uh, for women in transition that are going through divorce or, or um, trying to decide uh, whether or not that's going to be the path they take. So we really, I, I think the biggest thing for us is uh, a peer-led model. Uh, so at Empower Survivors, we, we don't have a psychiatrist or a psychologist on staff. Uh, what we are are certified peer support specialists that uh, through our own experiences are facilitating groups and that sort of thing. Um, of course, as, as a facilitator, uh, we do talk to other therapists to, to get information, to ask questions if, if we need to run something across somebody or something like that. Okay. But it's a peer-led initiative. So anybody who's involved with the organization has some, uh, either was abused themselves or a child of an abuse survivor. Which is value added to be a child of an abuse survivor as well. A different Absolutely. perspective, a different topic. So I really like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that people should try support groups. You may or may not like it. You mm -hmm. know, I've liked some. Then I was like, I'm never going back to that one. <laughs> so Absolutely. I think it's a safe space. And find the support group that works for you and that you fit in. I think that's Absolutely. very important. And, and the thing of it is, is, I mean, it's scary. It's scary to think about going to a group. I think the first time I ever thought about going to one, I, or, well, I wasn't thinking about it. It was something that the therapist told me they thought I needed. And I thought, how can I possibly open up to people that I don't know? Um, and that's scary. Uh, but if you can take the leap and you can do it, um, you know, really can be beneficial. And the thing that is, there's a lot of groups out there. So if one doesn't work, I always tell people, if you come to our organization and, and 
you're, you know, come to a group a couple of times. If it's not for you, then we'll try and help you find something that is. Because like I said earlier, not everybody heals the same and what's good for one may not be good for the other. So, yeah. mm-hmm. and I think you should try. Absolutely. So that's, that's how you know your healing journey is to just jump in there and try. Like I was in groups and um, I didn't realize this about myself that I'm truly an empath. I, I will cry the drop of a dime. You're on me. And I had one girl, my, her story was so horrific that I was crying. I wanted to just pray for her. I wanted to check on her at night. Like, I just got so overwhelmed with her. But I wasn't at a good healing place to really be able to deal with others' trauma. So yeah. that's something else, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I, was, I, I wasn't capable at that moment. I didn't realize and I could look back and see why I had a hard time in that group. Absolutely. Because, you know, I was even out of there crying. Like, <laughs> but I like groups, the right group for me. Absolutely. And I always say, too, if, if you are a survivor coming to a group for the first time, um, talk to your therapist about it. See if you're ready for that, because it's important that you are in that safe place, that you know grounding and grounding techniques and that sort of thing and, and aren't out of your window of tolerance. Uh, because, you know, sometimes hearing those stories can be triggering. Um, but I also think, uh, if you're at the place where you can try a peer support group for the first time, uh, you may realize for the first time in your life, uh, sitting in a group with other survivors, hearing them speak, uh, you, you might feel like, boy, I have never had so many people understand me without me not saying a word. Um, uh, I can remember the first time walking into a group myself. Uh, which I didn't know. I was with you. I, I didn't particularly like this group, but it was the first experience I ever had. Um, but there was one person in particular that I thought, okay, um, they get it. They understand. They're putting words to something that I can't even put words to at that point where I was at. Yeah. So I think it's very beneficial. My favorite group in my healing journey has been AA. I um, sure. shout out to Spiritual Progress, which is a women's group in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm. They are phenomenal. To be with women that are alcoholics, that understand all the other things that go with it and the trauma <laughs> and being a mother, like I feel like they are my sisters. I, oh, I, I absolutely love good. that group. And I didn't want to go to an AA meeting. I was like, you see it on TV. So I think it's worth just to try mm-hmm. to get to that next level. Like that's the best thing I've ever done. And I absolutely love it to be part of something. So find your place. Mary said she's tried six times. And then if that's not for her, she moves on. Good idea. Yeah. So it's really, really a good place to be. Mm-hmm. But I love that. I love that it's peer driven. Love that it's peer driven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the organization, you know, when we first started out, there was no real, real um, like peer initiatives. Uh, there was one place on the East Coast that I really, uh, I had called and I asked them, you know, hey, what's what's this peer-led initiative all about and da 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 And that was a model that I thought, you know, I really want that. I want that here in Minnesota. I want that here throughout the country, whether it's at Empower Survivors or other organizations starting their own. And today, uh, there are more peer support groups than ever before which I think is just wonderful. So whether it's Empower Survivors or some other group, like you said, give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is your peer support groups open nationally now that you have the Zoom meetings and everything? Mm -hmm. Anybody join now that you're open up? Absolutely. And the thing of it is, is I, I mean, we have people throughout the United States. We have people coming from Canada, the UK, uh, just depending. We usually the, the groups are small. Uh, so it's it can be intimate. It's not too overwhelming. Uh, so so yeah, it's really kind of nice to get to meet a lot of different people on different parts of their journey. I love that. Um, I love it, love it, love it. So sometimes COVID did have some positive go along with it. We was fighting it at first, but Ooh. now that we're doing more virtual, like we do virtual art therapy. I've been able to get more people in because it's not you know a closed group now. So there's some good that came out of COVID. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we had to learn to adjust, didn't we? Uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> I, I 
do want to address Val. Um, she just she she has a one. This is her first comment, and she says, "I struggle with repressed memories, so I don't have clear memories, but I do have emotional flashbacks mm. and some symptoms that indicate possible sexual abuse. I'm starting to work on forgiveness of those I don't remember." And myself, because I feel deep shame. I am the child of a sexual abuse survivor. Thank you for the work you are doing. Do you have a comment for Val, Elizabeth? You know, the memories are going to come when you're ready. And there's some memories that you may not remember. I think as survivors, we tend to uh, rem remember things in sections. Um, so some of them you may not remember, but that shame as you work through your trauma, as you're, you're with others that have lived experience or, or therapists or that sort of thing, that shame will diminish, but it's, it's hard. That shame is a hard thing to, to work with. It's, but it does, it does begin to ease as you get further along in your journey. Thank you. Um, thank you for everyone that has shared tonight. I always say that we shouldn't carry the shame. The abuser should. Mm -hmm. They should be ashamed of what they did to us. Mm -hmm. We should not be ashamed that they harmed us, took advantage of us, abused us. We shouldn't carry that. And so I really want people to, to work on it's not us and say, I'm not going to be embarrassed, I'm not going to be ashamed. They should be, you know. They Absolutely. But that shame, that's a hard one. It's a hard one. It's really, really hard. I can remember I used to call it the cloak of shame and I wore it. I wore it well. And uh it's tough, but it is you're right, it's it's not ours to have. And and so part of the healing journey is to take that and put it back on the perpetrators, the people that truly should house that shame. There you go. So we are winding down. We're getting to the end of this journey. What is something that you just want to share? I want you to share about the organization and just some last words with the audience. I would say uh, if you're nervous to come to a group, uh, give me a call. We can. I always start out with, um, you know, I, I think, it, like I said, I think it's really hard for a lot of survivors to come to an organization, to come to a group. And, and then on Zoom, that can add even a more uh, nervous because you're not, maybe you've never done that before, um, but you just take the step, take and make the call. Um, if it helps, we can sit down and have a conversation over the phone, over Zoom, uh, try the meetings. But most of all, you just gotta try and go easy on yourself. Um, be delicate with yourself, know that uh, you deserve love, you deserve support, you deserve to have people around you that are going to support you and um, and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And there's going to be days where you think there is no way I can go on that the, you know, maybe you're having horrible flashbacks and and it feels like you're doing minute by minute just to survive, but keep putting one foot in front of the other. And at those times where you truly feel like you may not be able to go on, keep going on because you're going to get through that muck and grime of all this garbage and it's going to get better. And, and you just got to keep pushing forward. It gets better. It really yeah. does. You can't see that, boy. You can like, oh, it's horrible. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it gets better. It truly does. How can um, anybody contact your organization? How can they contact you? Uh, they can either email us. They can go to our website at www.empowersurvivors.net. Uh, you can call me. Uh, the, uh, the number is 651-323. Four seven two one. Uh, so either of those ways are a great way to get a hold of us, or else you can send me an email at empowersurvivors at gmail .com. I love it. I love it. I am so um, just in awe of the work that you do. I knew that I wanted to have you on the show because I want people to use your resource. You are a great resource. You're on the West Coast, so the timing might be different than from a Hush No More event. 
And your poetry night was phenomenal. The the spoken Thank you. Oh, I enjoyed it. I so enjoyed it. Oh, it was good. A great space. So thank you for the events that you do, raising That's awareness. Good. Yeah, you're amazing, and I love your team, and I just hope that you all keep doing this because when you help one person, you're helping so many more. So thank Absolutely. you so very much, Elizabeth. And thank you, Dr. Vanessa, for having this platform and having me here. Tonight. I really appreciate it. You're lovely. You're welcome. Oh, I'm lovely. I love yeah, it. You're lovely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you heard from the amazing Elizabeth Sullivan <laughs> of Empower Survivors. She's great. I want to leave you all with just a word of encouragement that you can empower, be empowered, empower yourself. You can be happy again. You just have to want it and put in the work. It's not easy. You heard Elizabeth talk about the work that she put in. We get here by working hard, going to therapy, talking to ourselves, you know, pouring into others. It's how we get here. So you can do it just like we did. So please be encouraged. Also, Join Hush No More for events throughout this month. It is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. This is one of our busiest month of the year. Raising awareness, participating in events in your area. Tomorrow night, we have Jenna McKay. She's going to talk about the story nobody wants to hear. It's sex trafficking, which is also sexual assault. So join us tomorrow night at 8 p.m. That's a special because we're normally on Tuesdays. Next Tuesday, we have Richard and Kathy Butler of Comfort in the Storm. They're going to talk about what happens when you find out your child has been molested. What do you do? What do you do? How do you handle it? And how do you report it? On the 27th, we have Dr. Lori Pitts, and she's going to talk about healing from the inside out. So what does healing look like? How can you get there from a natural, spiritual way? It's really a good way to just look at yourself. Look at yourself and show what, what is on the outside might not be what's right on the inside. You know, we wear these masks and I want you to think about that. Your outside don't look like your inside. And we're going to talk about that with Dr. Lori. Finally, I want to go over our big event that's coming up. This Friday, we have spoken word. If you are a poet, I would love for you to participate. If you want to sing a song, if you just want to share some information with us, we would love for you to come. It's a safe space Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Saturday, we have Survivor the Warrior. We're going to do that in Columbia, South Carolina, but we will also be streaming it live at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Come out. We're going to be social distancing and learn from head instructor Lance Adams. He's phenomenal. I believe that if you want to fight back, we can teach you how to fight back. We can give you some tools to be able to protect yourself, right? So join us on Saturday. Sunday, we have the Hush No More documentary screening that shares the stories of survivors who have overcame the Hush topics. You could grab you some popcorn. Stream it with us at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then on April the 24th, we have our Child Sexual Abuse, Fo Sexual Abuse Forum, which is going to be pretty neat this year because we're going to be talking about technology and how can you protect your children from a perspective of the Internet, from their cell phones. You need to know technology because abusers are floating on the World Wide Web. So let's protect our children. I want parents to tune in with your kids because we have advice for both of you. So I am truly honored to be here with you all. I would love for you to contact us at hushnomore.org or at our phone number 888-285-2161. Or you can follow us on social media platforms. We provide free counseling. We have art therapy on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Join us. But we would love for you to be part of our community and help us show love and kindness to survivors. So thank you once again, Elizabeth. Thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to just being a blessing to all of you. Thank you.